that will introduce the conclusion bias. We estimate the children effect will be biased as well too. So, so that means without adjustment, we may compare apples to oranges. That's what we try to avoid. Okay, for any of this, you know, the cohort study. So, what's the approach? What is the people consider as a gold standard? method to analyze the treatment effect is the randomized clinical trial. Everyone knows it. But the randomized clinical trial cannot be done for all the studies for many reasons. For example, infeasibility and unethical for that. For example, the, like a, you know, chronic leukemia used to using the allogenetic transplant, sort of a cure of the method. Lately, they develop a, a, a magic drug Okay, called Glida. So the so the field changed to the use that the drug. So it's a, it's unethical you do the you know study because that drug is so response so good. So the field changed then it's a harder to conduct in some situations. And in and the other thing is this one like a stem cell transplant. You know if you want to compare the identical sibling transplant versus chemotherapy. Not everyone will, every patient will have a sibling identical donor. Risk. So this is a, another issue there. Also, there is sometimes a cost and a time related. Especially right now, say that if you want to study the long-term effect, it's a very hard to you know ask you know the NIH give you money to do ten years study. So this is a very very long sometimes costly and time related. So those limited and some other issues limited to, you know, randomized the clinical can be, try can be done for some situations. So but then in this uh, situation we still need to study the treatment effect, what they do. So researchers, physicians and uh, need to analyze this treatment effect using observational cohort study data. Okay, those data from the non-randomized clinical trial. So for such study using this non-randomized clinical trial data, we need to show the difference in outcome is attributed to the difference in treatment, not from the, the patient selection bias. So we need to sort that out. So that's the whole thing to why people develop the propensity approach. So now recently the it has been proposed called the propensity score approach has been proposed to mimic the clinical trial. Okay? You analyze the 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 non randomized clinical trials data. One approach is using the regression method and that's the outcome based. This one is approach is a not outcome based. It's a mimic, try to mimic the clinical trial. Okay, so try to balance the, the, the treatment assignment instead of look the outcome. So that's the one. Okay, so propensity score approach can be used to produce unbiased uh, comparison of treatment effect. So here is the key under some conditions. Okay, there is no research. There still have some conditions, okay? And the propensity score approach has been widely adopted recently. Here's a little interesting uh, statistics. In 1984, actually, proposed by the two uh, statisticians from Harvard and the propensity score, Don Rubin and uh, Robin. And uh, so you can see, this is the the face of a propensity score used in the PubMed or the list articles. From 83 to 97, you know, this is uh, 14 years or 15 years, that's the only single digit paper each year mentioning the propensity score phrase. Okay, at 83, 84, it's only varying like a two, three. All right, from 1998 to 2000, Two, it's about a tenth at the beginning, then up to the 30s, 40s. And then 
you can see increasing quite dramatically from the year of 2007, single year, there are 250 papers about managing the, the propensity score. So it's getting popular, popular and the people to use it quite often now and accepted the input for many studies. So what is the propensity score? Before we're talking about that, the first let's look at, it. we try to, to estimate is the unbiased treatment effect. So what is this? This is called the treatment causal effect. This is the true, true, true treatment causal effect. What is that one? That R of A is the response if the subject receive a treatment. A equals one for the case that's treated, and zero is control not treated, placebo, or alternative standard treatment. All right. The, the true treatment called the true treatment causal effect is the e average of the outcome from the treatment treated minus the average effect of the from the not treated. So what is the best way to S to get this this causal effect? People say the best way to do is the true one. It is the same subject, patient, treated twice. You treated the placebo or standard treatment and treated the, the new treatment. Now that's the true, because every subject treated twice, you know what the effect is. But it, it's impossible to do it, all right? Especially the cancer study, it's inethical to do, you know, patient treated two treatments, okay? So, so that's what's the, in the observation data, what we really observe, we really observe is the effect of this uh, average effect of the those who receive the treatment and the difference with the, those the outcome, average outcome, those not receive the treatment. So those are the patient receive the treatment, those patients are not receive the treatment. But uh, for the non-randomized, for an observational study, and because this A and the B, A equals zero, A equals one, they are not randomized. They have different chance to receive. So population are different. So the A does not equal to one. So, so without any adjustment, you just look at this effect. It's a bias. It's not the true causal effect. So that's here the key because since the subjects are not randomly assigned to the treatment, okay. So in a randomized clinical trial, treatment assignment A and the response are conditionally independent giving all the risk factors. Because everybody has the same chance to flip a point to say, you know, fair point, say, head you receive the treatment, the tail you receive the, the placebo. So in that case, everybody has the same chance to receive the treatment or placebo. And uh, so therefore, under this conditional independent assumption, one can show that one equals two. So you don't need to make an adjustment. So in other words, a randomized clinical trial leads to an unbiased estimate of treatment causal effect. Okay. But in the, not every study you know, can be done through the randomized clinical trial. So we need to use it, the data. So what, what do we do and what is the propensity score? Propensity score is the probability of receiving treatment A equals 1 treatment, given the set of covariates, okay? And this pi of z equals zero, uh, between zero and one. Here is a key. There is a positive probability of receiving treatment, even he or she, patient, received a no treatment. Although he received a no treatment, he still, will, he or she, will have a positive probability chance to get the 
treat, receive a treatment, the new treatment. Okay, so this is the propensity score, and these two people, Rosenbaum and Rubin, and they, in the 1983, they showed that conditioning on the propensity score allows for unbiased estimation of the treatment. So in other words, you balancing the propensity score. If the two people are same propensity score, even they are they are received the treatment and the other received the non not treatment, the chance they receive the treatment are same. So that's why they say balancing the propensity score mimics the randomized clinical trial, because the clinical trial in the case is a fifty percent chance. And the control is not receive the case. He has a chance to receive the treatment is a 50% too. But he just flipped a coin, he didn't see the tail head, he see the tail he signed to the lung treatment. So these two, everybody will have the same probability chance to receive the, the treatment in the randomized clinical trial. I don't see how you can justify that assumption. What is it? I mean, I see how you can match people on covariates. No, that's I talk about to you. That's a very good question. Okay, people always sometimes ask me, say, what? Since propensity score just depends on the covariance Z, let's say, say, say Z is gender and age, all right? And insurance status. No, whatever. Okay. Let's yeah. just word that you. Yeah. The people say, oh, you match the exactly two propensity score and one is a male, old. The other is a female, young. They have the same propensity score, but they are different. So you prefer match the covariance, match the gender, and match the age. You look at that like a regression approach in your head. You say, ha, huh, those ones all will affect the outcome. I balance those ones will have the same effect the outcome. Here, we don't look at the outcome. We just balanced the chance to receive the treatment probability to receive the treatment. So that means if balancing the capacity score to cohorts, that means all the two cohorts the chance to receive the, the treatment and the placebo are the same. So otherwise, why the randomized clinical trial will work? They never have one person can match a person older with the female with the other person. They are not. They just say everybody will have same ch the chance to get in the treatment uh, safe. But don't you then have to assume that when you recruit these cohorts into the study that both your control and your active treatment group were temporally linked, i.e. you could not have someone who was getting a treatment in year 2005, whereas in 2004 that you had changed clinical practice where you changed something because then you are already in put, I mean, I understand about the probability, but the yeah. probability is only true if these are contemporaneous pa patients. And if you go retroactively to draw them out, how do you know that you didn't draw a person from 1996 and 2005 that's, or whatever. That's another, another, another question, answer to your question. Is I know your question very good. This is when we study the treatment effect, you put the A time should be the same, right? And then one, uh, one argument is say we should never ba only balance the disease patient related character, not the treatment related character. Because treatment related character, they also often are packaged. You get this treatment, they get this conditioning, you cannot mess it up. Okay, so they are not, you cannot fully balance. Okay, so you, you look at the treatment A versus the treatment B, but the conditioning you cannot balance because there are some of those are packaged to that. So, and uh, so some, some, sometimes they, sometimes people, you know, to do this will avoid to balance the, the treatment related value, only for the patient and only related to the patient and the, the you know, the disease type value, more important. So that's uh, the one 
uh, kind of answer your question. Say, if we, if you don't accept that, you will never, because like in, I said at the beginning, some field already moved on. So this the some some new regiments comes up. No, nobody is the older regiment anymore. So they don't have the year of overlap. But you still want to see people want to see you know people is a premature field moved on to the world. Or maybe still will have benefit for a specific group of patients. So you want to study even they are the time and period they are this job. Only assume that the you know of course over the time the of the you know, the supportive care or the other things are improved. It's not a fully, you know, study always has limitations, I agree with you. Okay. So, answer your questions is uh, two different uh, way you think about it. For the randomized clinical trial, we never look at the, are there any two people who they are the same. All the, the distribution of the same. They never balance the indi individual. They just a chance to get it. Let's see. Well, it's something that's going through my mind. I mean, this is a very interesting conversation about causal inference. And basically, how human subject research work is never possible to have the exact same condition, right? Because you can't have the exact one same individual. Two taking twice. the same pill at the same point in time. So yeah, it, right. it's all always operating under the counterfactual framework. And in the setting of a counterfactual framework, there's essentially two types of exchangeability. There's marginal exchangeability and conditional exchangeability. With marginal being the one that you potentially can achieve if you have a large randomized clinical trial where your randomization holds up in a large number of subjects. That's the only way you ever would even get close to marginal exchangeability. Everything else is condition exchangeable. If you have small randomized clinical trial, poor randomization will still end up with conditional exchangeability. That's why some researchers opt to use adjustment modeling, even randomized clinical yeah. trial, where randomization occurs. That's right. And all that is always just going to get at Conditional exchangeability. Yeah, that's the one. Right. Is it? There is no free lunch. Even clinical trial, randomized clinical trial, is not. A, is not a, you know. Have some shortcomings as well too. Right. And okay. what I said, I said because. I so like this one's like in the perpetual score, you still there's no free lunch. There's still need this assumption to call ignorability. So there's an assumption that actually you cannot check. And, you know, sort of what I was getting at is that I think there's a huge misconception out there that randomized clinical trials always, always provide unbiased estimates, no. which is not true. That's not that you, uh, that, yeah. Actually, we have, we have an article reviewed that the three actually the published the article. I was the wrong author. It's a published, it's that evaluated the, the many ways randomized clinical trial cohort study, expert opinions, and uh, so many different, each one have short force, not that one is the same. You know. But relatively, randomized clinical trial is sort of, a, has less problem than the others. If you do appropriate, have sufficient sample size. All right, so this is that one, so now, what is the true capacity score, which is unknown? Okay, so we need to estimate so because this one is say giving some kind of condition covariant risk factor. What chance will receive the treatment? So it's unknown. So we need to estimate it, and so commonly we use the logistic regression model to estimate it, and. Uh, based on a set of covariants, which determines the treatment assignment, not determined for the outcome, okay? So that's always the problem, say you miss some covariance, you will miss the problem too. So that, that's you cannot help, even for the regression approach, for this approach, both work. And the capacity score range from zero to one, and the estimation 
only depends on the known covariance, okay? So such as patient characteristics, something missing, then it's a problem, okay? So um, it is, a, the nice part is it's independent of outcome. It's not outcome driven. So when we compute the propensity score, we're balancing propensity score, we don't need to look at the outcome, so bias. In, you know, we don't, we're not influenced by the outcomes. That's the nice part. Okay? So how to use the propensity score once we get that? And they suggest the three common methods to estimate the treatment effect using propensity score. One is stratification, and what that means, you compute the propensity score from the pool of the sample, then chop it into four to five groups. They say four or five groups is enough. Okay, so then each, within the groups, each group, the propensity score range is relatively close, then they do the, the stratified analysis between the five, four or five groups, okay? So, and the other one is the most commonly used is called the propensity score matching. The other one is using the, treat the covariance adjustment, treating the propensity score as a continuous covariance. Some other new pro pro approach using this matching and the plus the adjustment for the covariance. Because you match it cannot be matching the exact number. Propensity score, they are from zero to one. They're only close, okay? So some people further adjust that as a covariance. For make further adjustment. Okay. I'm just, uh, Today I talk about the propensity or try to talk about all the good part of the propensity score, okay? So the, you know, the, because propensity score, of course, it's the basically dimension reduction. If you have five covariance, now you lose on the one, one dimension of the covariance. You will lose some information, okay? So, uh, you mentioned that uh, propensity score is not influenced by the outcomes, right? That the propensity score is not yeah. influenced? But isn't it derived based on logistic regression? Um, logistic regression, one is a received treatment. It's not a, not the order. Okay. So it's just the, the treatment assigned. Okay. Okay. Very good question. So now, most common method to analyze the, the propensity of the, using propensity score to analyze data is called the propensity score matching. So I'm talking about a little bit more. So what, how do we do match? So the common, most common way to do is say, we try to find this case and the control they are with similar propensity score. So how, what's the similar means, right? So commonly used to say, we choose for example, like a half or one of the standard deviation of the propensity score. You compute the propensity score between zero and one, you can estimate those who and find the standard deviation. So then you usually people commonly say, well, half of the standard deviation or one of the standard deviation, they are quite close. So that's the way. So, but if you're using this marker, they are still, we have a lot of possible controls. So what do you do? Commonly there's one is randomly select one match control among all potential possible match controls. Or the other way is that, say, just select the one with the smallest difference in propensity score. They are more close. Okay? So these are the two uh, ways to accommodate them. And how to analyze the propensity score match the pair data. So to estimate the treatment effect, okay, Propensity or matching is often used to reduce or eliminate the effect of the treatment selection bias. So actually this paper by Austin uh, published in 2009 and uh, he did an extensive review because I, I read this paper. And uh, this, uh, he reviewed the, the medical literature from the published in the 1996 to 2000. He reviewed the total paper close to 1,000 papers. Those papers all has a propensity score. Ma uh, no, all have matching. 
not necessarily matching on the propensity score, just matching the covariance, matching the pair data studies. So he found that the majority of those studies just ignoring the matching nature. Just match it and just like a regular study. Okay? Does not make any adjustment. And then he also said that similar findings were observed in cardiovascular surgery literature and just general cardiovascular, you know, other, other fields as well too. So the question is how to analyze match the pair data. Do we need to account for the matching? So the answer is yes. Because those matching the pair, the subject, the case, and the control in within a pair, they are, although are randomly selected one, but they are similar in the baseline covariance risk factor. They are similar. So in other words, they are not truly independent. They have some relationship. So, propensity score matching sample are not from independent observations. These two are have same covariance, okay, risk factors. So, therefore, uh, in his study, the paper did a background study. Also, he did a simulation study and uh, showed that adjust the pair, uh, match the pair analysis, adjust for the matching the covariance makes adjustment, it will, will be needed to have a correct nominal level of type 1 error. Otherwise, the, the, the too conservative, instead of, you know, suppose 5% nominal level to reject with under the non hypothesis, they will have a way low. And in some cases, it will be too high. So it can be either way. So, so here means uh, we need to make some adjustment. All right. So for the all the uh, other methods that do the regression relatively simple, but uh, for the match the pair is how to analyze a little bit uh, more uh, work. So here I will go through how to do this slow a bone marrow transparent study. Okay, and uh, because this uh, for illustrative purpose, uh, we consider. Uh, a CRBM TR study. And uh, what's the CRBM TR? Is the Center for International Blood and Marrow Transparent Research. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a located at the uh, Statistical Center and Data Collection Center is located at the MCW, actually disputing. So it's a fifth floor. I work with them. So, and uh, this and, uh, has a, you know, the more than 500 transplant centers worldwide contribute the data to this uh, to this center. Okay, so and uh, this is a, a little bit unique because this is the time to event data. So analyze is a little bit unique. So I talk about this uh, this example. So this CRBN study try to compare the outcome at the beginning. I said compare the allogenetic transplant, identical sibling transplant versus autologous transplant for diffuse large BCR lymphoma. Okay? Study totally, there are 916 adults, adult patients, aged from 18 to 60. The 837 received the autologous transplant, and the 79 received the myeloblative it's an identical sibling transplant. Transplant between 1995 and 2003. And patient, the data were reported to the CRBMTR by 156 centers in 17 different countries. And, uh, and this is not a randomized clinical trial study, so we need to make an adjustment. Let's, before we do that, first let's see what these two cohorts look like, okay? At the beginning I say that, you know, the allogenetic transplant mainly treated for the high-risk patient. Here we can say that, we can see that, look like disease stage, advanced disease stage, and for the allo, there are 62% 
stage four compared to autologous transplant, only 39%. It's a high stage. Okay? For the B, uh, B symptoms at the diagnosis is a 58% versus 46%. All these are significant. Okay? So marrow involvement of 42 versus 17%. And extra modulate disease involvement is 70% versus 57%. Okay, you can see that allogenetic uses of bone marrow, so the 7%, almost every nine, more than 90% uses of prefer brother for the autologous stress. And the other important factor here is this one that is significant, that is the, you know, the time from diagnosis to transplant. So from this short table, and we can see that allogenetic transplant is treated for high risk of patient. If we don't make any adjustment, that means uh, the effect will be, autologous effect will be overestimated, if anything. Because allogenetic is treated as high risk of patient and also they have, you know, called GDHD, they have early deaths, okay, treatment related deaths. For the autologous there's no such early deaths. So there's, for the allogenetic usually it's a, counts about 10 to 20 percent of the, the treatment related early deaths. So, so if there is no later benefit, then you know the auto will be, be, be good. But uh, if without adjustment, auto, the treatment effect estimate will be biased, will be overestimated. The treatment. We can see that. So that's the way is a, is a for the high risk patient. So we need to make adjustment. So CRMTR this published study, pub, uh, I think published in the BDMT, Biology of Bone Marrow Transplant. So this uh, study did a both regression study method and the matched pair analysis. Actually, I'm the statistician for this uh, study. and. Uh, Many co-authors, when we did the regression, everybody said, wow, this study, you know, has a problem because it's only the 70, say here, 79 is auto, and the majority overwhelming are the autologous transplant. They say the regression may not be very well adjusted because you adjust everything is dominated by this group, okay? So we did a, a study, actually, sort of validated study. Conclusion is the same, so everybody happy. <laughs> that, that's good. Okay, actually when uh, they say, oh, you need to do X, I said, I already did it. So I sent the result, everybody said. <laughs> so here, is the propensity score was calculated based on fitting a logistical regression model with these key risk factors, age, sex, Conophysis score, okay, disease stage, okay, marrow involvement, uh, sensitivity to tumor, graft source, year of transplant, and the time from diagnosis to transplant, number of the tumor, tumor lines before the transplant, so all these things. And uh, now this is a little, uh, 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 to discuss a little bit of that one. So there are two approaches. When we do regression, we also try to model building what's the variables influence the outcome. Now, for this one, yeah, you can do is say model building which one is influence the treatment assignment. And the other people, many people arguing that we don't really need it to, when you predict the propensity score, you have more variable, even not significant, the will be benefit. So there's two approaches, okay? So, uh, you can look at it, several of the, the Darwin Rubin students who wrote an extensive uh, literature review paper. So here, in this data set, with propensive score, we calculate that here's the combined is a medium is a 0.04 range from this point almost zero to 9.90, and the standard error is 0.123, and the case you can see that this is the mean and this is the range. And they're quite diff very different because 
they are treating different patients. Okay. See, if you met, what we did a match for the, based on the propensity score, so you can see that if we're within one standard deviation, and for the men, quite many cases cannot, cannot find a match. Because this minus one standard error is above this highest in the control group. So that. But uh, believe me, if we try to match, the, often I do without the matching on those match directly on the risk factors. Boy, it's very hard to find a match. Many cases you cannot find. Often I sometimes see that, like a 40 cases, I have three, four thousand controls, end up very difficult to find a lot of It's because some of those are very unique. This is a dumb question. I'm on a statistical back. So, so you've got all of these risk factors that you're going to um, compute. The compute. How do you weight each of these risk factors? Or do you weight them all equally in the model, and that way no, you when you model it will give you. Oh, it, it gives so you. When, you, when you yeah, when you fit this logistic question, there is a coefficient. This coefficient say the beta if say you know Konofsky score high versus low, so they will tell you how more likely to get the receive the, the treatment versus the other. You are right. The weight is presented in this model. Okay. Anyway, then what we did, I did was this way. For each arrow for the case patient, and any autologous patient control within a difference in propensity score less than one standard deviation was considered as a potential match. And then a match was selected with the smallest difference in propensity score, sort of tie match, not randomly selected. We can do either way. And then after this one for each case, then I do the next, next case, find a match, okay? So this step one and two for each cases. Then after this, then I repeated this step one and two for four times. Try to find the maximum one to four match. Okay, it's not one to one. Try to increase in the control because I have almost nine thousand controls. So this. So here is end of the result. I found the forty nine pairs at a one to four match. Two pairs are uh, one to three match. And the 12 pairs, one, so sorry, one to two match. Oh, sorry, I got typo. And the one to one match is six pairs. And the 10 cases cannot find any match controls. So that's the way because, uh, because you can see that this end is not overlapped. Can you use the combined source, the passive support from the combined sample to do the matching? No, no, no. Each individual has uh, only use a combined for this standard deviation. When you fit the model to calculate the propensity score, you use. You have to use the order. Otherwise, you cannot because you need to use the case and the control. Okay. So the summary there is only. So you use the propensity score from the whole. Yeah, because the, here the key question is the key point is this one. Even the subject that received the control, he still will have a probability. These are the probability to receive a case. Imagine. He will have this chance to receive the, 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 the treatment. So that's all. So so here. To how to analyze the, this data, right? So, yeah, I found this. And then the, for, because this is the time to event data, so it's a little bit unique. If it's not time to data, it's all the time if just like a regular, if you compare the mean, just using the paired t-test. If the you know outcome is a zero, 1, we can use a conditional logistic regression, just conditional on the pair. And for the time to event data, uh, there are two approaches. One is a stratified model, one commonly used Cox model, 
all the other used called marginal model. And the stratified model is time to data. Is if the one-to-one -one pair, if first the subject time is censored, then the whole pair is removed from the comparison. There is no comparison anymore because that's the way it is. So there is some sometimes it's a, it's a disadvantage. But both methods try to adjust the correlation within match the pair. So here the variable, say this is the indicator of treatment, L equals one for L trans time, zero for autologous, and this is the time from trans time to death or end of follow-up in months. That equals one for died subject, zero for alive, and I pair is index of the matched pair. So it's the first pair, second pair, you know, this one. So we need to do, if we do stratified ones, I give the SAS code. Other software probably can do too, so. But some of those I'm not too familiar. And uh, see here, called PROC, PHREG model, and then you need to do is, a, this is indicator sensor, and this equals arrow is the indicator of the treatment, and the strata is the I pair, I pair. Or marginal model, it will not exclude any subject pairs. Even the within a pair, first the subject is a sensor, still in the mode. comparison. This one called the plot pH lab using this option statement, and this is instead of strata using ID of I pair. So here, let's look at the outcome. You can see that one is arrow versus auto. Auto is the best one. So baseline, the, this is the trillion failure. That is a one minus uh, called the progression free survival. So what is event? Event is dead, death, or progression. Relapse or get advanced. So this we can see almost twice more likely to fail for the arrow compared to the autologous. Quite significant. And then we can see that the difference mainly come from the first two <coughs> months. You can see twice more likely. After two months, it's almost one. There's no difference. Now, without adjustment, because arrow is treating the worst patient, this is a make adjustment. Without adjustment, the first two months, the relative risk is three times. Say that again. Three times. No, say the whole sentence again. See, without adjustment, using all the data, uh -huh. without any adjusting the risk factor, just univariant analysis, arrow versus auto, for the first two months effect, relative risk increasing from two to three. So in other words, it's overestimate. This mm -hmm. one is make some adjustment. Similar picture for here. So, I did a, 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 a plot, see here. This autologous, if it overestimated the autologous treatment effect, if we without adjusting the imbalance of those, uh, the cohorts. See here, we can see that. This is the difference of the pre progression free survival. And uh, you can see that the main rate change is the first two months, and the pre threat. And then the, this, the blue line is the univariant. Without any adjustment, autologous probability of PFS for autologous minus 70, 839, and this 70, 90. You can see the difference is over. This is based on the propensity score. You can see that the difference, like here, is 10%. So here, the total rate, the advantage is 10%. You, you the difference is about 10%. So the Overly estimate the treatment effect. Although conclusion, both are say autologous is better have survival probability than the allogenetic transplant. But without adjustment, we overestimate. It's too optimistic. Uh, actually, it's related to how you calculated the propensity score. I understand the fact that even the control group has a probability for a propensity to receive the treatment. Yeah. But I don't understand how you would match because uh, the cases would always have the have a higher propensity to receive treatment, right? No, so no, would you match? Not necessarily. See here. 
<coughs> so the case is a range is still from here. So many subjects is about the, you know the point two two six uh, you know the point two. Here the control is a low, but still many of they are go up to the point eight six. So you, there's overlap. If there's no overlap, forget you cannot do. Is so that, is that also I mean this is a good example but in general is the pattern that when you use a propensity score based analysis that the you get a more precise estimate but the qualitative answer is not changed or do you actually sometimes see changes where qualitatively it's really gone the opposite way you can go you can so this in is this, in this case because it's overestimate if there's a no benefit then this could be or the, or the, you know, if this curve is good, the rather curve, the true curve, is good under, that means better, but then you, if suppose this curve is under zero, right. that means uh, arrow is better. Uh, yeah, auto is uh, worse. But then you have uh, overestimated, you give the wrong opposite conclusion. Okay, but for this case, it's the same, the same direction, but you will be think about that. It's almost like the overestimate about double. So because it's only the difference about 10%, and now you say 20%. In some cases here, it's 15%. You say now it's 25%. So you're overestimating this tree. OK? So this is a similar picture for the uh, Disease free, uh, this is over our survival, and uh, it's a little bit less magnitude. We have 10% here in the 7 to 8%. Here is the conclusion. What's the benefit of using that? It's useful and unbiased method to analyze the treatment effect and easy to adjust a large number of risk factors. If you try to do match study, if you have 50 covariates, you cannot match, but this one is okay and a useful method to design for saving time and money. So when you do some studies, you can design the match for the, some propensical match for the key variables, then you can further to the analysis, to recruit more data or something, you know, some designs. And it's independent of what, but also it has some limited, of course, there's some, uh, I just limited, uh, some, I can think about it. There's some the limitations, you say, only adjust the observed risk factors, okay? Randomize the clinical trial because it, if you done <coughs> correctly, appropriate, okay? Uh, not like, uh, you know, you mentioned the say was insufficient the case, then this problem. So if you done correctly, those that will balance all the risk factors. You don't, you observe, you don't observe the balance, okay? But, but still there's some randomized clinical trial where have some other short but then not in this, okay? So, but in this case, we can only the adjust for those observe the risk factors, try to balance the tumor. If something missing, like a regression method, you miss it. You cannot do anything, okay? And uh, bias may still occur because to obtain unbiased inference using Kopensko need some assumptions and conditions. It's not free. Okay. So these assumptions that may not hold. Okay, so that's uh, so these are the uh, uh, reference and this is the uh, pioneer paper. <coughs> they published the first paper, a couple of papers uh, in the nineteen eighty three. And this is the paper I did for the uh, informa study. And uh, this is uh, some applied paper for how to analyze the matched pair data. And this is the paper I refer to the data uh, reference review to how to analyze the, the matched pair data. So, is there potentially any application besides what we think of as a treatment um, application? Exposures, uh, any any 
Yeah. Cohort studies. Any cohort study, if you want to compare between two groups, basically not necessarily are called treatment. You can yeah. call groups, two group of patients. Or, okay. or people. And for group of people, yes. You know, you can, you know, say for example, you know, is this, a, you know, environmental factors from your work in the world compared to the clinic. So you, you, the people will not be overlapped, but many other things you can, yeah. you can match, right, patients, you know, the subjects, you know, like age or environment. So you try to say, what well, are there any difference? In this outcome, is the, the not treatment effect. The incidence of the, of the, you know, as mass, whatever. You can do those as well. Can I ask a question about the matching? Oh, step? yeah, this is the slides called questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm looking for. <laughs> uh, that's on slide 22. Oh, that's 20. about the matching step using the propensity this one? You, yes. About the matching result, what do you mean by one to four matching? Oh, this is a one case match four controls. So one allocation match four. Four, yeah, because we have almost 900 auto controls. So I do this, do this steps is for the repeat the four times. Not the first step of four times, because I let the other possible controls to match for the other. Case. Some people you know, sometimes some case easy use it and other case cannot manage so these techniques. So Many software is already written how to manage. So we can uh, assuming for maybe for one to four matching for those five patients mm -hmm. they have same they, have the they are the same pair. Oh. You need to adjust within that pair. So the index will be the same. These five subjects were the same. It's the first pair index one. One, 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 one. Okay. Could you explain how uh, a stratified, stratified analysis could be done based on the propensity analysis? Like okay, yeah, that's a commonly used it when they test the mean. They want to see the two, two means in the lab, those observations. So those ones, you, you, you know, they computed the, all the propensity score. They don't do match. They just chop it into four or five groups. Okay. And then within the groups, they say, oh, this propensity to go pretty close. They say four or five is enough. But of course, there is a, you need to look at the data. If there is no overlap much, so that will not be good. So to how to analyze just using stratify the t-test. OK? All right. Thank you. OK. <laughs>